Well, good morning. Welcome. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at Renewal. Uh, thank you for joining us for our uh, Sunday worship service. We begin each Sunday worship service each week with what we uh, refer to as a call to worship, which is just a time where we orient our hearts to the riches that we have in God, no matter what life may bring to us. Our call to worship this week comes from Psalm 112. It'll be on the screen for you here. I invite you to read responsibly with me, to read the parts that say all. I'll read both parts, the part that says minister and the part that says all, just to keep us moving. Let's read this call, this invitation to worship together. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. Would you pray with me? Father, we believe that these things are true of you, that you will give us to one day see victory over all the things that plague us, even from such a time as this. And whether that comes partially in this life or only fully in the time when you return and come back to us in that great day when you keep the promise that you made, the promise of a father to his children to come back for us. Father, we pray that you would give us to persevere for that day when we get to see the wealth and riches of who you are, when we count ourselves blessed, not because of something material that we have here, but because we materially have you in that day. God, would you help us as we wait, meet us in our time this morning, that we might truly encounter you and have our hearts refreshed and changed. It's in your Son's name and by your Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. I invite you to join us in the time where we respond to who God is in song.
is the blessed assurance that we have of the life to come. He is our hope. And this morning we're going to spend just a little bit of time confessing the hope that we have in him through the Apostles' Creed. This is a ancient creed that reflects what all Christians at all times and all places have believed. This is a universal creed that we share with our brothers and sisters around the world and down through history. And when we confess our belief in a creed, we're not doing something that other people don't do. Everyone has a creed. We all have something that we live by, a reason for being, a goal that orients our lives. This, though, is the Christian confession. The question that it would ask you if you're not a Christian is, what is your creed then? What is your belief? What orients your life? If it's a different creed than this one, does it hold out the same hope that this one holds? So I invite you, if you're not a Christian, to listen to this creed this morning and hear what it is that we believe. What is the hope that we put our, our faith in as Christians? And if you are a Christian, if this is your creed for life, are you living like it's true? Are you living like the hope is real? I invite you, Christian, to listen as well and to remember the hope that is already yours. And I'm actually going to ask you to do something a little bit different this morning. I know you're at home. I would like to invite you to actually stand in your faith as we confess this together to stand before God and read this as those who will one day stand before him in person in glory and confess this same hope there. So let's read this together. Christians, what is it that we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Indeed, Christians, these things are our hope, and we believe they are coming for us when Christ comes for us. And with such a hope, let's take our hearts to our Heavenly Father in prayer, asking Him to meet this faith of ours with His powerful presence using the Lord's Prayer. Let's say this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing once more to this God in whom we put our hope. Riches beyond all measure Could never satisfy my heart Even the greatest pleasure This world can offer never compare to all you are. You are my greatest treasure, the desire of my heart. Whatever it costs me, I give it a free.
Take it all. Father, take what is yours. Father, the things we own, um, the things we say are mine, our possession, Father, we know it's from you. Uh, that way we even have these things for use. So, Father, we give it to you. Empty hands, we bring nothing but praises to your name, Father. May you be glorified in our weakness. May you be glorified in our um, being poor in this world. For Father, you make all great. You make all things great through your hands alone, through your power, so that, Father, you may get all the glory. So, Father, um, as we look on the things, on the money, on the riches of earth, may we look to you and say, Father, here it is. Use it and use us for your will to be done, for your name to be known. Father, let us not hoard, but let us spread your word and truth in the gospel of Christ. So, Father, now we pray for our heart melted. Uh, show us what love looks like in giving. Show us what love looks like in spending. Um, so, Father, focus our hearts and be with us as we receive your word. Be with um, Pastor Dwight as he ministers to us. And, of course, let your spirit uh, be ever with us so that we may be in your presence always. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we come now to our time of announcements where we like to let you know what's going on in the life of our church, even in a time like this. I actually have five announcements for you today, so brace yourself. We can do this. Number one is just a very simple welcome to those of you who are new. I want to direct you towards the I'm New page uh, link in the notes below and just let you know that we have a chat feature going on in our YouTube feed this week so you can interact with people. Uh, say hello. Feel free uh, to chat with others there as we have our service. Uh, second announcement is another reminder about our city mission conference. Uh, we rotate each year between a overseas missions conference and a city mission conference. And this year we're focusing on our city in this conference. How can we be a church that, that seeks, that promotes, that furthers the good of our city? That's what we're focusing on in these conferences and ours uh, this year is going to take place this coming Friday, October 23rd in the evening and in the afternoon of Saturday the 24th. Our speaker for our conference this year is Dr. Erwin Entz, uh, actually a friend of mine from Washington, D.C. Uh, and the theme that he's going to speak on for us is unity, diversity, 
and the church at its best. Uh, Dr. Entz is the executive director of something called the Institute for Cross-Cultural Mission, uh, which is an organization connected to uh, Grace Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, so he's going to be bringing some great insight for us on racial reconciliation and faith and how we internalize these things as the church and grow in these things as a church. He's going to be preaching for us next Sunday as well. Now, please follow the links in the notes section of this video to RSVP for that conference. We don't want you to miss out on that. All right, two down. Three to go. Number three, uh, we have a missionary update that's going to be coming out to you, but we're doing that a little differently than we normally do. Uh, we're going to be sending out a physical newsletter that gives you updates on our missionaries. We believe this is the safest way to update you about what's going on in their lives and their ministry, particularly for those who are serving in closed countries. If you have updated your address in our church database, if you did that this past spring, you'll be getting a newsletter from us that gives you that update. If you haven't done that and you'd like to get the update from us, please use the link below in the notes to do so, so that you can actually uh, receive the missionary update by mail. Number four, almost done. Uh, our outdoor communion services were rained out last week uh, for our West Philly campuses our West Philly campus, but it's been rescheduled uh, this Sunday, today, actually at four o'clock and five o'clock at Belmont Plateau for our West Philly campus. Uh, if you want to excuse me, participate, uh, you must RSVP using the links uh, below by 1 p.m. today. Uh, we will have some safety protocols in place, which is partly why we ask you to RSVP. Uh, and those are including, but not limited to, wearing masks, uh, social distancing, and individual communion cups and no singing. So please sign up for that uh, West Philly campus if you uh, feel comfortable doing so. Uh, we have that again available for you today. Lastly, number five, we made it. Uh, our church and politics webinar is taking place uh, tomorrow night. I'm actually going to be leading that for us. It's going to be starting at 8 p.m. and it's called The Church and politics. And it's something we're putting on in this uh, particularly challenging political season because we believe it's important to address how we, as God's people, understand our role in the politics of the world uh, that's going on all around us every day, all day, it seems like. In particular, we're going to talk through a few key questions together, uh, such as, is the church called to be uh, political at all? And if it is, how should we think about uh, the different political views that surround us? How do we engage with each other, uh, with our friends, neighbors, and families on these things? And how do we approach uh, thinking about voting in light of all that? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but how do we think about how we as Christians make our choices uh, as voters? And we hope that this webinar will help equip you to really better love your neighbor in this time and also challenge you, uh, no matter what your political views are, to actually find your greatest hope, not in politics, not in a party, not in a president, but in Jesus Christ, our eternal King. So that's our announcements. Uh, we're transitioning from announcements to our time of offering in prayer. Uh, in the olden days, I can say now before coronavirus, we did our time of offering in person. Obviously, uh, everything's virtual now. So we would still ask you uh, if you call Renewal your home, if you are a member or regular attender here, uh, to give in response to the grace you have received, uh, to give if you are still uh, receiving an income. If you uh, have not, if that's not the place that you're in, we want to come alongside you. We're not asking you uh, to make yourself go into worse financial straits than you may be. Uh, so don't feel any compulsion uh, to give if you are really uh, struggling financially right now. And please actually reach out to us. People have given generously to make this time more livable for you, and we'd love to uh, connect with you and serve you in that way. Uh, but giving or, or offering is just a time, as we just sang, to recognize uh, that all I have is yours to begin with. And so what we do in our time of offering is just acknowledge that and bow our hearts down before this fact as we give to the work of God's kingdom together. So I would invite you to do that uh, in the regular ways that you have been from home. But we are going to spend a little time in intercessory prayer uh, as we do each week. And our topic this week is gospel transformation. We're going to pray particularly uh, that we are a people who have radically changed lives from the inside out because of 
the gospel. And we're going to also pray that we would be a people set free by this gospel to grow, serve, and also love our neighbors, but never seeking to make that service somehow our justification before God, somehow a reason for why God loves us, to still do those things, but not put our hope in those things. And lastly, uh, to pray that we handle the stewardship of the finances that God has given us faithfully never letting these things become idols, things that control our hearts and our hopes, and always ready to share what God has given with us, has given us with those in need. And we just encourage you uh, to remember those that you know that are in financial difficult times right now. As we just uh, had our time of referencing our online giving to do that, to give towards those who are in need in the most concrete way, also remember them in prayer now. So let's, let's go before the Lord and pray for these things. Father, we ask that you would transform our lives from the inside out, that you would make us new, that you would start over what needs to be started over in our hearts, that we just can't seem to start over, that you would pull us back from what we can't seem to step back from, God, that you would change us from a people who are just in the stream of our culture's call to consume and to buy more and to have more and to do more, and that instead you would make us a more generous people that we would find ways to think of ourselves less and others more, that we might find new ways to give, that we might be excited about finding a new opportunity to give instead of just finding a new thing to buy. God, would you remember our brothers and sisters who are in financial difficult times right now, those who are on the streets or who are in their homes. God, that you would remember all your people, that you would call us to remember those who are even not your people, but who are in difficult times that we might meet them with the grace that you have shown us. Father, we pray that you would teach us how to be generous because you are generous. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm actually going to turn over to our deaconess Chrissy Kim this week to read our scripture passage for us. Chrissy? Hi, my name's Chrissy. I'm one of the deaconesses at Renewal Church. I'm going to be reading some scripture this morning from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8. To Ecclesiastes 6 verse 9. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches, riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil which one toils under the sun the few days of the life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, for he will not remember much the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the joy in his heart. 
There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place? All the toil of a man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, Renewal family, and a warm welcome to any who are visiting us today virtually. Uh, we sincerely welcome you. We have been studying the book of Ecclesiastes together, and today the author, or the preacher as he refers to himself, uh, comes to a topic and addresses a topic that is very relevant to us, especially as Americans, and that is the topic of the love of money and the pursuit of wealth. And in keeping with the theme of the book, the author is stressing that a life spent pursuing wealth, uh, pursuing money and riches, is ultimately a life of vanity. Now, perhaps uh, on hearing this, some of you are immediately thinking, well, this, this message isn't for me. I, I'm not rich. I don't even really have much money. Um, how can it be my problem? Uh, perhaps you're thinking to yourself, it, you know, I'll listen but I'm really listening for a, a friend of mine who's got this issue so, so that I can help them. Or perhaps you're sitting next to your spouse and you're like, you really need to listen to this, especially after spending all this money this past week uh, during Amazon Prime, uh, filling our, our cart with things that uh, we don't really need, like battery-operated potato peelers, but simply because it's 75% off, let's buy it. And so there you are nudging your spouse. You really need to listen to this. Uh, maybe that's your mindset. You don't think it's your issue. Um, but the fact of the matter is we live in a society and a culture that is steeped in the love of money in, in chasing wealth in acquiring the newest, the latest, the best, Right? Our currency has written on it, in God we trust, but it's probably a more accurate statement to say, in this we trust, in the money we trust. This is the air we breathe. This is the water we're swimming in. So much so that like a fish swimming along, seeing another fish and saying, hey, how's the water today? Uh, and that fish responding, what the heck is water? Right? It, this, this, value so pervades our culture, this love of money so pervades our culture that we would be naive to think that we're not susceptible, that we haven't been affected by it. Because the fact of the matter is, regardless of your income level, all of us are susceptible to being influenced in this way, uh, to have a unhealthy uh, love of money and desire uh, to pursue it. And so we need the word of God to expose the truth about our relationship to money uh, this morning. We need the word of God to act much like a COVID mask, where until and unless you put your mask on, you may not realize your breath stinks. We need the word of God to show us. We need the word of God to expose if there is a stinkiness, something afoul about our relationship to money. And so I'd like to explore this passage along three main themes that we see, three main themes that arise from this text, and I'll share them as we go. But before we do so, let me invite us to just pray, and let's invite the Lord to indeed expose our hearts this morning. 
Dear Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your word once again that is a lamp unto our feet. We pray that indeed you would guide and, and shine uh, your light, the light of your word upon our hearts, exposing dark and unhealthy parts uh, so that we might turn from these things, not only for our own good, but for the good of others and for your glory. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's explore again these, uh, this text under three main themes. And so the first theme uh, we see here is the preacher addresses the craving for money. The craving for money. Verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So the preacher is making the point that when you make money and the acquisition of wealth and material things, your focus, your goal in life, that no amount will ever be enough. That's how craving money works. Those are the dynamics. John D. Rockefeller in his time was among the richest men in the world. And when he was asked how much money is enough, he famously replied, just a little bit more. See, the more you have, the more you're going to want. And the more you have, the less satisfied you're going to be with what you have. Perhaps there was a time in your life, in your younger years, where if you were to see the income that you're making right now, the income you're making today, and your younger self could see that, perhaps you would have been overjoyed, shocked. Wow, I can't believe that I could make that kind of money. But now that you're actually making it, perhaps you're discontent. You see in yourself a desire for more, wanting more. A craving for money works a lot like our physical cravings, right? The more you feed the appetite, the more the appetite for that thing is going to grow. Um, for many months, perhaps Maybe, maybe it's been a year or two, I've largely weaned myself off of my formerly favorite drink, Diet Coke, um, and I've been very disciplined about it. Uh, but recently I was at a restaurant, I had a Coke, Diet Coke with my meal, and just in that moment I just kind of remembered how much I love Diet Coke. It just tasted so good after ha not having it for so long. And so uh, a, a day or two later, I was at the grocery and I decided to pick up a pack of Diet Coke. And I told myself, I'll drink it in moderation. You know, a can here and a can there. But that very day, when I brought it home, I immediately opened one. A few hours later, I had a second one. And then a few hours later, I was tempted to have a third and I said, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, but you see, that's how appetite works. The more you feed it, the more you scratch the itch, the more it, it, it incites a desire for more. You just end up wanting more. Feed the craving and the appetite grows. In C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, a wise old demon is training his nephew Wormwood. It's, it's a fictional work. And he tells him the goal is to inflame in humans an ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing flavor. That's the formula to destroy human beings. That leads to obsession and addiction. Now, none of this should come as a surprise to us because as the preacher told us already previously in the book, God has set eternity into man's heart. In other words, as Blaise Pascal said, the infinite abyss in us, there's an infinite abyss that exists with us and it can only be filled with an infinite and immutable object being God himself. Second, 
In this passage, we see not only the craving for money described and, and the dynamics of that, but we also see the consequences of the love of money, the consequences of the love of money. When you ignore the purpose for which something was designed and use it in a way that it was not intended to be used, for example, hammering a nail with your phone, you will destroy it. When you ignore the purpose for which something was designed, you will damage it. Likewise, since we were created to love and to be loved by God, to serve and glorify Him, there will be damaging consequences if you live your life for some other purpose, namely in the service of money and material possessions. It will have damaging consequences. Look at verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So the contrast is made between someone who works with their hands and sleeps well, even if they don't have as much, as opposed to the rich person who, uh, with a full stomach, has insomnia. They do not rest well at night. They are restless. Why is that? Why could that be? Well, as we said, the discontentment with what we have could keep you up because you're tossing and turning and stressing about how to get more money and how to not lose the money you already have. But there's more reasons for restlessness. Verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. In other words, the more you acquire, the more others are gonna want. Whether that's the government, whether that's family, whether that's old friends who suddenly come out of the woodwork now that you're wealthy. Um, we see this happening all the time with athletes who didn't grow up with much and came out of impoverished communities and suddenly become rich. And then out of the woodwork come all these long lost relatives and, and friends and family asking them for money. The more you acquire, the more people are going to want and expect of you. The more you acquire, the more space you're going to need to hold all that stuff. And then the more you're going to need to pay others to take care of that stuff. Your house is so big, now you need a housekeeper. Now you need a landscaper. Now you need a pool guy. And the list goes on and on and on. The more stuff you add, the more stress you're going to add. Verse 17, he describes the life lived in the pursuit of money and wealth in this way. All his days he eats in darkness. Two weeks ago, we talked about the relational isolation that occurs when we are overly obsessive and driven. You know, money is often the cause of so much relational turmoil. Money specifically is often the cause of so much marital turmoil. The preacher continues in much vexation, meaning constantly being frustrated, anxious, and stressed over money. He says, and sickness. Being overly concerned about money can literally burn a hole in your stomach, ulcers. And overconsumption will expand your stomach, right? Derek Kidner, uh, Old Testament theologian, he says, Speaking of the existence of fitness clubs in this country, it is one of our human absurdities to pour out money and effort just to undo the damage of money and ease. Now, certainly for some, uh, issues with weight and being overweight are, are far more complex. But uh, for a lot of people, we just simply eat too much, right? And, and, and again, we live in a country that overspends, and part of what we overspend on is our overeating. And then we have to spend more money to undo the effects of our overeating. And this is what Kidner's talking about, the absurdity of that. So again, 
all his days he eats in darkness in much vexation and sickness and anger anger towards anyone or anything that threatens your money anger that you don't have enough anger because you feel like you deserve more and sometimes this anger is directed at God so hearing this list do you see these qualities in your own life this morning due to money in this regard are you beginning to smell your own breath and perhaps it's not so fresh that maybe you have more of a of a problem with money than you thought or you realized but finally beyond being anxious and stressed and relational turmoil and physical unhealthiness and anger more foundational and perhaps the most costly the most costly consequence of all is that a life spent in the pursuit of money and wealth is a life spent in vain it is a wasted life or we could say it like this the greatest consequence of living a life whose main aim is the pursuit of wealth and money the greatest consequence of such a life is that that life will be inconsequential it will be a wasted life a life spent in vain now, why is that? Let's hear the logic of the preacher. In, in verses 13 to 17, he describes the life of a man who gained riches. And it says, kept to his own work, uh, hurt in the ways which we just described earlier. It says, but he gained all these riches and then those riches were lost in a bad venture. And as a result, he has nothing left, nothing to leave his son. And employing the same words as Job in verse 15, it says of this man, he came from his mother's room, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This certainly happens in our world. There are many stories, again, of pro athletes who made millions, but due to poor financial advice, they end up losing all that money. They go bankrupt and they have nothing left to show. They have nothing left except broken bodies and empty bank accounts. Tragic. But even if this type of situation of a sudden loss of riches, even if that doesn't happen to you specifically like that, the fact of the matter is every one of us will one day have to leave everything behind because you see death death comes to us all and you can't take anything with you and so again this is the vanity that the preacher is emphasizing for those chasing money for those whose lives are all about just chasing wealth and possessions when all is said and done you don't get to keep any of it anyway it is a vanity. Some, some are going to lose it sooner, but all of us are going to lose it eventually because you can't take anything with you when this life is over. And then, of course, some will say, yeah, well, that's obvious. And, and even if you can't take everything with you after death, it's still better, at least in this life, to just have more right? Uh, that's still better than not having enough. I'd rather just have a lot and, and, and enjoy it as much as I can temporarily. Um, it, at least there'll be some joy in that. And the preacher addresses that mindset as well. Verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 2 to 6, he describes the life of another man who had it all, wealth, possessions, even honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. In other words, it makes his stomach turn. Verse 3, If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off 
than he. Martin Luther called these verses a description of a rich man who lacks nothing for a good and happy life and yet does not have one. He's got all the ingredients that the world says will make for a happy and fulfilled life, but he doesn't have one. The preacher brings up this heartbreaking topic of a stillborn child who never got a start in life. And yet the point he makes is that the, the stillborn child has an advantage over this man because at least the stillborn child has found rest. They're rested in the arms of God. Whereas this man, his life is full of all these good things, but he's restless. He's discontent. He's unsatisfied. And so what good is it, he says in verse 6, if you could live 2,000 years, but you have no contentment in life? What good is that? Satisfaction is not guaranteed simply by having more, whether more money, more kids, more days of your life. Satisfaction is not guaranteed simply by having more. Going back to Rockefeller, after he made his millions, he also said, I would give all that I have now if I could experience the contentment and satisfaction in the days when I was making $3 a week. All that stuff didn't make him more content. There was a New York Times article that appeared some time ago, and of course it's still applicable today, and it was entitled, In Pursuit of Affluence at a High Price. And this is what the researcher said. The adage that money can't buy happiness may be familiar, but it is easily forgotten in a consumer society. A much more persistent and seductive message is beamed from every television screen. Contentment is available for the price of this car or that computer, a little more getting, a little more spending. Over the last few years, however, psychological researchers have amassed an impressive body of data suggesting that satisfaction simply is not for sale. Not only does having more things prove to be unfulfilling, but people for whom affluence is a priority in life tend to experience an unusual degree of anxiety and depression, as well as a lower overall level of well-being. Likewise, those who would like nothing more to be famous or attractive do not fare as well, psychologically speaking, as those who primarily want to develop close relationships, be responsible, and contribute to community. Earlier research had demonstrated that neither income or attractiveness were strongly correlated with a sense of well-being. But Dr. Richard Ryan, professor of psychology at the University of Rochester, and Tim Kasser, who is now assistant professor of psychology at Knox College in Illinois, have discovered the news is even worse. In three sets of studies published in leading psychology journals since 1993, the researchers sketch an increasingly bleak portrait of people who value extrinsic goals like money, fame, and beauty. Such people are not only more depressed than others, but also report more behavioral problems and physical discomfort as well as scoring lower on measures of vitality and self-actualization. The researchers could have saved a lot of time by reading the book of Ecclesiastes because this is the exact point the preacher is making. You can have it all, but still suffer from a poverty of contentment, which leads to our third and final point, contentment's source and intended consequence. Contentment's source and intended consequence. Verse 18 to 20, behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment and all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. 
Here, the preacher describes a man who has found contentment in what God has given him. Money and possessions are not inherently evil. They are, in fact, good gifts of God. They just make a horrible master. This man is content with what he has, so much so that his days are flying by because he's just occupied with joy in his heart. There's sincere joy in his heart. Now, this reminds us of another person who actually lived this way, the Apostle Paul. And he writes in Philippians 4, 10 to 13, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your con- revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Isn't this something we would all want? Genuine contentment where you're not anxious fretting, in vexation, living angry over, in particular, money and possessions, where there's an abiding joy that's not based on your circumstances or your bank balances, but a deeply unshakable and abiding joy. So the question is, where is that found? Where is such contentment found? And it's certainly not in sheer willpower right? Be content, be content, just be happy with what you have. We know that doesn't work. The preacher makes clear that not only are wealth and possessions gifts of God, but the power to enjoy them is a gift of God as well. The power to enjoy them, the power to be content comes from him. And this is why Paul writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So then, okay, contentment comes from God. But how? Does God just zap us with it? So you hear this sermon and you just say, God, give me contentment. And you're just zapped with it. And everything's going to be okay from that point out. We wish it were that simple. But that's not how it works. What does Paul say? He says, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and want and being content. It's something he learned. The well-known hymn by Horatio Spafford, It Is Well, right? The verses go, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Did you catch that? Thou hast taught me to say it as well. It had to be learned. It had to be something learned. And and that learning, it's not a zapping, it's a learning, it's a process. It it, it in, involves activity, engagement, that when you feel discontentment rising in your heart, that drives an unhealthy pursuit of wanting more, 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 you actively, there's an activity to it. You, it's not passive. You actively meditate on the truth of the gospel. You actively meditate in your mind, in your heart on what you know to be true of Christ. And that's something we all need to practice, to learn. You don't just get zapped with it. To focus and meditate on the truth, first of all, most foundationally, that as we said, we were made for eternity. The infinite abyss within us can only be filled by the infinite God. That Christ is the ultimate treasure in whom our souls find rest. And so even if you don't get as many toys and trinkets uh, out there that the world says are going to fill you up, you can still live in contentment. You may not have the box but you have the diamond. You have the most important thing. You may not get all the frills in life. You may not have the box, 
but you have the diamond. You have Christ. Furthermore, oftentimes our quest for money and desire for money and possessions is because of what it provides us. For some, they desire money because of the security it brings. But you see, Jesus, what does he promise you? Look at the birds of the air and lilies of the field. I feed them and I clothe them. How much more important and precious are you to me? Will I not take care of your needs? Of course I'm going to provide for you. Our ultimate security is in Him, and He promises that to us. Some people want money because of the status it affords. They believe it'll gain them respect and admiration from others, giving them a sense of worth. But your worth and your value were never meant to be based on your accomplishments, on your income, on any positions or title or acclaim. It was never meant to be. What the gospel tells us is that our worth lies in the fact that even though because of our rebellion we had made ourselves unworthy, yet in His grace, in His mercy, God chose to set His love upon us and He laid down His life because He treasured you. He treasured you. You are of great infinite worth to Him. So much so that he was willing to lay down his life. That is where our worth and value are found. So much so that when you believe that and when you root your heart in that, you no longer need to live your life needing to find that from others. But not only is the contentment found in Christ and the truth of the gospel meant to serve your own good, it's also meant to serve the good of others. That's the intended consequence as well. And what do I mean by that? You see, if you're discontent with your financial situation, if you're obsessed with getting more and more and more, you're not going to be a very generous person. You'll be tight-fisted. You will not be a cheerful giver. But if, like Paul, you learn to be content, then you're able to give and use this temporary earthly wealth for the purposes of God's eternal kingdom. As Paul did, you're not going to sit on the sidelines when things get uncomfortable and when finances get tight. In plenty and in want, you'll be out there serving the purposes of God's kingdom and meeting the needs of others. This passage begins with the preacher describing how in the world, We see the oppression of the poor and violation of justice. And he explains it's because of the fact that those in leadership are just looking out for self. Everyone's just looking out for self. And the poor suffer because of it and stay poor. We serve a Savior, as it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Our Lord and Savior Jesus literally impoverished himself for others. And his call to us is that we too should be a people willing to sacrificially give to meet the needs of others. That we don't live our lives just looking out for self and happy that we're taken care of. But we are meant to live to give just as Christ gave to us. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. The Apostle Paul writes, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You see, Paul doesn't just say it's 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 good enough for you to just stop stealing. Just don't steal. And and that's good. No, he says, no, go get it. Stop stealing, but go get a job. Why? Not just so that you can live comfortably so that you have something to share with others. You see, that's the heart of a Christian because that's the heart of Christ. We have a sacrificial and generous God, and we are meant to be a sacrificial and generous people. That is what is supposed to mark the people of God. Again, the preacher calls in this passage, he calls our wealth and possessions a gift of God. He keeps saying that. It's a gift of God. They're from His hand. But these gifts are also meant to be stewarded, not just sat on, not buried in the ground, but stewarded well. I'll close with this. I recently read a book 
I want to highly recommend it by James C. Petty, entitled Act of Grace, The Power of Generosity to Change Your Life, the Church, and the World. And it addresses thoroughly and in detail the biblical view of money, right? It, in, it, in, it addresses it in a far more thorough way than I could in this one sermon. I want to encourage you to go and read it. It's very practical as well. But I'm going to end with this quote from him. He says, Our money is God's investment in his own kingdom. He has endowed and positioned each individual Christian with unique spiritual gifts and specific monies that are needed so that when they are combined with those of other believers, the church can carry out all that he has commanded it to do at every period in history. As they say in African American churches, if it is God's will, it is God's bill. The church as a whole, especially in America, can fund the works of God that are needed today. All the missionaries that need to be sent out, the church corporately has the funds to support the missionaries that God wants to send. The author of this book, James C. Petty, shares extensive research done to demonstrate that if the church at large, especially American Christians, if we simply just tithed, right? If we just simply tithed billions of dollars, billions of dollars would be freed up to serve the deepest needs of our city and globally. If Christians just handled money as we're supposed to, billions would be freed up to do mighty works throughout the world and meet the deepest needs of the world. And so renewal, in closing, I'll say this, I am encouraged because many of you are using your wealth and finances in ways that do reflect the values and priorities of Christ and the gospel. In a time where your church experience is, is this. It could be very easy for many of you to say, I'm not getting as much out of this, and so I'm not going to give, but you haven't done that. In fact, many of you have gone above and beyond and have generously even given to the COVID relief fund to help meet the needs of those who are suffering. I am tremendously encouraged, and I'm humbled by what I see in so many of you guys. And I praise God for the way that so many of us have seen our finances as a stewardship and are not burying it, but seeking to multiply it to the glory of God and for the good of others. And may he continue to lead us in that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word that reveals truth in our hearts. All of us are affected by the values of this world and particularly living in this country and its over-obsession with money and wealth and possessions. I pray, thanking you for the ways in which the Word has shined light into our hearts. I know it did for me. And ways in which, Lord, we need to continue to submit our money and our use of it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, recognizing it for the gift that it is, and also wanting to steward it the best that we can to your glory. Free us. Free us from the vanity of chasing money. And instead, may we live out of the freedom of the gospel as we know Christ being our ultimate treasure. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's close in this final song. Christ.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate treasure, the satisfier of our souls, the love of God the Father, whose infinite love truly fills you up, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who continues to guide us and lead us into the truth, all truth, including the truth about money, may he be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his grace and go with generous hearts to serve the world.